All right, Ms. Wallace, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. My name is Owen Hall, Jr. from the Grazi Dia School, and I'd like to talk a bit today about faculty collaborative networks and the future of higher education. Uh, just a heads up, we will be having a drawing for Jerry Flynn's car later today. <laughs> so please pay close attention because we will be handing out some clues as we proceed. I'd like to dedicate these remarks today to my two partners in crime, Professor Ken Coe and Professor Chuck Morrissey, who aided and abetted in our little enterprise. And to start by saying that we have certainly come a long way in education. Uh, if we look back when Sir Isaac Pittman first started the first correspondence course in 1840 in England, uh, and interestingly enough, two other technological developments that occurred at almost the same time, the telegraph, which was the internet of its day, and then one of my heroes, Charles Babbage, who created the design for the first modern computer. So those three items, distance learning, the ability to communicate, and computer technology, fast forward to today, we are in a whole new mindset. And that's what I'd like to share with you today uh, with respect to higher education in general and um, graduate management education in particular. As we all know, we're faced with many challenges in higher education today, and I'd like to talk briefly about those. The new era of mobile learning, knowledge at any time, any place, uh, customized to the individual student. Imagine a world where we have each youngster has a Watson, as seen on Jeopardy, that is customizing their learning process for each student. We all know students do not all learn at the same rate or pace. And so a customized strategy, compliments of Mr. Babbage in a way. Collaboration, we are now in a globalized world. We need to be able to reach out and integrate with our colleagues on a worldwide basis. We see, for an example, increased interest in the ability to have faculty participating globally via the internet. And I might add, you missed the punchline, but I have another one for you later. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't leave with the keys. <laughs> and uh, we see the idea that eventually we may see, instead of schools being accredited, we may see indeed faculty being accredited because you may participate in courses on a global basis. That's the new reality set. Um, faculty adoption. What has the response been to the new technology? And it's rapid growth. And of course, we need to address that. And that's the role of a collaborative network. And then try to bring it home with some, some ideas. I'll call your attention to the Drucker comment at the bottom. We're 15 years into the process. Uh, just think about where banks were 15 years ago, brick and mortar. Uh, now it's almost all online. And so let me suggest that uh, he wasn't too far off. Now, there's no question about it that business, and of course our main customer at the Grazi Dia School is the business community are increasingly relying on the internet, and therefore they're looking for web-savvy students in order to compete in this global economy. Secondly, we see increased costs in education. We recently did a recruiting drive for our new MBA online program, and a fair amount of the questions were, is it worth $80,000? I better be pretty funny or something to answer that question, right? <laughs> or have a job app standing yeah. by. I think we agree the economy uh, is still not fully recovered. Uh, we have more and more companies leaving the state of California and taking jobs with them. And that's a serious challenge as well. Uh, our stakeholders are global in scope, as I reported earlier. Uh, there is an increased interest in sustainability. The president talked about it last night. We have the Office of Sustainability at Pepperdine, the idea being less student commuting, less faculty commuting, 
less reliance on print book material, more reliance on digital material. All helps support the sustainability <laughs> process. MOOCs, of course, is uh, moving very rapidly. They haven't quite figured out the business model, but it will get around to that. There's a couple of scenarios. But clearly, the idea of attracting students by providing free courses, you have a vehicle then for student recruiting, among other things. And of course, the hot topic today in business, and it's beginning to uh, fill over into uh, education, is analytics. Every few years, the consulting companies, the Accenture, the Boston Group, uh, SAP, SAS, have to come up with new buzzwords in order for them to continue to sell their wares. And so analytics is huge right now. And basically, it's the idea that since we have been capturing so much data from the internet, called euphemistically big data, we need some ways to process this. I'm sure that every one of you who has ever bought a new car or a refrigerator or had your car serviced, before you get home there's a survey to fill out. And of course all of that's being captured. In academics uh, we've been a little behind the eight ball on that a bit. Uh, but we're catching up and where analysis can help in student recruiting and retention, help in improving student learning outcomes, and even help the administration. Unbelievably so. Uh, so, some slants and trends as it relates to this online business. Online learning programs are growing at a much more significant rate than traditional programs. Uh, it's about uh, five to one. So there, the growth in traditional college programs is around 2%. Online programs are growing at about 5%. 65% of institutions of higher learning believe the internet is part of their new mission. That's an incredible statistic and obviously one that we need to build on. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a growing interest in university administrators to adopt the analytics paradigm, not only for recruiting as a specific example, matching up counselors to specific students based on their characteristics. Not all counselors sell as well to all types of students. It's much like when you go to the internet to buy shampoo and up comes a little ad, here's some conditioner based on your buying habits in the past. The same thing can apply to student recruiting and retention. And with these price tags we're talking about, obviously that is of some interest. Also, the analytics model can help provide an expansion of the learning experience through intelligent tutors. Uh, again, not everyone learns the same rate or pace, and so these instruments can provide content specifically to that student based on student background and characteristics and also help the administration allocate scarce resources. Now, in terms of program deliveries, at the Grazius Dia School, we have these flavors. We continue with our traditional face-to-face, -face, uh, both in our Malibu full-time residential program and our uh, professional program held at night, uh, our so-called FEMBA program. However, we've added some new goodies to the uh, store. Just like any other business, we have to add new products. So we have what is called a blended, or our Chinese friends uh, call it hybrid, where we combine both the best practices face-to-face -face with the power of the internet. So for an example, one <clears throat> week you might be doing an in-class experience, and the next week you're on the internet, and then back to the classroom the next week, and so forth. We also have just launched, in fact, uh, some uh, three weeks ago, the Gradidia School first online MBA program. We had a cohort group of 22 students. We met with them uh, as our kickoff uh, at Malibu, and it is a very limited residency program. And then finally, MOOCs, which is the ability to capture a course at any time, at any place, Harvard and MIT have launched a massive program here. Again, the business model hasn't quite worked out, but I'm sure it will get around to it. Such things as you get the course free, but if you want to interact with the professor, there's a charge. <laughs> so they may decline to do that. Uh, or you get a deep discount in the course 
compared to the traditional cost. And there will be some other models that come along in this regard. The point of the slide is <coughs> multiple ways of delivering knowledge. And as in any other business entity, we're going to be seeing more options, not fewer, as the days press ahead. Now, in terms of our online program, again, very new, uh, we've decided to really focus on high touch, meaning while we are not with them in person, and humorously enough, by the way, the feedback already is from the students, could we have another experience or two together? And so we're looking at that as we speak. And in terms of our student population, uh, approximately 90% of them live outside the local district here. So we're talking uh, four or five uh, in the Midwest and back East. We have one student from Japan, a member of the armed forces. Uh, but they've already expressed an interest of, gee, could we get together for some more laughs? Uh, and so, <laughs> why not? Uh, M learning, so a serious use of the internet in terms of distribution of content material. For an example, we are currently offering, you can use a P book, the P book runs 250 bucks, or you can use an ebook at $90. And so we'll give the students the option of doing that. And, there are some other variations on that theme. But that's the idea behind knowledge, anytime, any place, self-paced. <coughs> also, our curriculum, in order to maintain our brand, is exactly the same curriculum as in our FEMBA evening program. Interestingly enough, we have used this vehicle, the online program, to bring change to our <coughs> evening program, which we could never have done through normal channels. So interestingly enough, we sort of turn the whole equation around, and we're giving a paper on this with our Chinese friends next summer, of using the method of delivery as a way to make curriculum reform, as opposed to the traditional way you do the curriculum reform and then you move into delivery. So we basically turn this whole thing upside down and have made some significant alterations vis-a-vis -vis our past experiences, which are slow. Also, as I mentioned, flexibility, convenience. Uh, working adults have to travel, can't make class one night, not to worry. Uh, we're up on the web. We archive the lectures. And so you're able to stay in tune in real time in that regard. And as I mentioned earlier, it supports the Pepperdine uh, goal of enhancing sustainability in terms of our natural resources. Okay, MOOCs, uh, again, a hot topic. It is a vehicle for student recruiting at a time when students are hard to recruit. I get you on board with a course and then I introduce you to the program. So that's one of the advantages of the MOOC strategy. Uh, we can accept the courses for degree program. Here are a couple of pricing models. Here are several strategic partnerships that are involved. And I might add, in general in high, higher education, strategic alliances or partnerships is the key ingredient. You team with other folks globally in order to enhance your product area. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> uh, sir, uh, you're doing some fine work there. And, uh, bingo, start a little later. Yeah, that's it, all right. So I can't stress enough the importance of developing strategic partners around the globe in order to complement what we're doing as opposed to reinventing everything internally. That's the notion. So you can have a strategic partnership in terms of another institution. Uh, we have a situation where we don't have enough students to make this elective class, but we integrate with a partner school then can put a cohort team together. That's the power of these strategic alliances. And a lot of AACSB, that's our accrediting body, globally are doing that as we speak. And we need to do that as well. And finally, we have put together our first MOOCs course, uh, thanks to Jim DeLolio, uh, uh, for test marketing and statistics or statistics. 
depending on how you like to say that. Uh, and if, if it doesn't work, we're going to blame Jim. And if it does work, I'm going to take all the credit. So it's the same old story. Uh, and we'll be happy to share that with you. If you want to send me an email, we'll give you the link, and you could take a little peek. Again, it turns out uh, not every kid who comes to the business school comes with the same background. So we have two-thirds of our students <coughs> who basically do not have an undergraduate degree in business. So when you start talking about this kind of stuff, it's, huh? And so as much tutorial support or background courses as possible turns out to be a real plus. OK, now the so-called e-learning success model uh, comes from Delone, who put this together about 2005, basically has three ingredients associated with it. One, the design of the system. Is content available? on a 24-7 basis, and is it quality content? So that's the first leg of this triangle. Secondly, the delivery. Are you happy with the way the content is being delivered? And thirdly, measuring <coughs> outcomes, and that's why we have the Office of Institutional Effectiveness here. Are we delivering the goods in terms of both employability and empowering our students? And so those three legs of the stool, and you have to do them all. You can't just be good in two if you're going to be successful in this new world of uh, virtual learning. Now, this, uh, and I apologize for this, rather complicated graphic uh, is the state of the art at Pepperdine <coughs> University today. I would give Jerry credit, but I give him too much credit already. Uh, I was with President Benton, not to be a name dropper recently, and I said <laughs> we invested about $35 million in this puppy, and he went like this. So uh, we're probably in excess of $50 million. Now, listen to this story. We've given a variation on this presentation in the past on a global basis, and we've had a lot of small institutions come up and say, how can we get on board with this? They can't invest $50 million, but they would like to have access to this learning system package. And so there may be a new business model for you, Mr. Flynn, and actually write that down. Yeah. Now, if we look at it, uh, we have uh, Jerry Flynn's domain over here uh, providing uh, Sakai, our learning management system, which, by the way, is what we're using for our first online MBA program. Uh, and uh, it provides the student with access to all of the content material uh, in a convenient format and time and place. Then we have at the business school some customized tools. This, by the way, is the logo for our uh, online partner, uh, Embanet, if you will. <coughs> and they, um, they are helping us author uh, the various courses. So for an example, you would turn in content. We put together a little simulation, and they actually produce the final product for us in a nice little animation. The one we did recently, it was a meeting of some folks, and, and they were discussing a business decision. And you could click on each one, and they would speak about a piece of the action. And then, interestingly enough, up would come some questions. So you would have to answer the question to proceed along with, uh, with the simulation. And uh, it was, uh, they've done a nice job for us. And then we have over here some more detailed aspects of the uh, Grazia uh, licensing procedure and then some pilot areas over here. And then I try to report that linking all of this together, which is the main focus of our comments today, is the collaboration network. The ability to connect with faculty both within the school, across schools, and then across the globe. Why reinvent the wheel? Why not take advantage of other people's insights and draw from those ideas? And that's what the collaboration network process is all about. Now, faculty adoption. This is the classic Rogers model. Came up in the early 1960s. He was talking about, at the time, hybrid. Hey, that's good, hybrid learning. Not quite, it was hybrid corn and how quickly hybrid <laughs> corn would be adopted in the agricultural industry. Fair enough. And so he kind of coined this concept that 
Again, not everyone's the same. <coughs> in the adoption of new technologies, and there are a variety of other uh, technology adoption models around, but the gist was there'll be a few pioneers who will get in early. Uh, and in Roger's case, the idea was that uh, in a business community, it's, it's hard to suggest that eventually if hybrid corn makes sense, and it did, and it does, uh, pretty soon everybody <coughs> adopts it because otherwise you have at a competitive disadvantage. Now, we uh, at the Brazi Dia School started uh, looking at online learning, hybrid learning um, uh, about three to four years ago. We had a few folks who were really excited about this. Uh, but the main game is to grab this majority. And by the way, for you statistics affectionado, this is the old empirical rule where you can divide things up into one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma. But the key here is to capture the majority of the faculty to wish to engage in this new learning experience. And to do that, a couple of things have to happen. One, it has to work. Otherwise, people get buzzed off real quick. Two, it's got to be easy to use. Three, it's got to be reliable. And then most important of all, you need to have incentives to encourage its use. And so Dean Smith, doing some more name dropping, mm -hmm. um, initiated about two years ago or a little bit more, a, our first hybrid blended learning uh, study group and ultimately handed out iPads as part <coughs> of participating in that experience. Those are the kind of incentives you need to attract uh, the majority of the faculty into this new idea. Now you'll notice to the right there are two more groups, laggards. Laggards are those that are going to have to be shown that there is no downside in what this is about, foolproof, if you will. And then, of course, my favorite category, which, by the way, I added, which was not in the original uh, Rogers model, uh, the Luddites. No matter what it is, probably not going to go with the program on that. The good news is we still have enough of our traditional programs around to facilitate the Luddites, but there will always be some Luddites. That's just the nature of uh, the beast. So this model suggests that you get a cohort group going, you prove things out, and then you start to fish uh, in the main tank where you can encourage everyone to begin to participate. And it can be at a variety of levels. You don't have to be all online. You could be in a hybrid mode where you maybe give a webinar every other week or every third week or assignments on the internet. So there's a lot of mixing and matching that can occur here. Now, to the main event. Last spring, uh, in probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes Jerry Flynn ever made, <laughs> he funded me and Kenko and, and Chuck Morrissey into studying uh, collaboration here at Pepperdine University. So among other things, we conducted a survey of the faculty across all five <coughs> schools in the sense of trying to understand, first of all, their appreciation of the power of the internet, number one, and their assessment as to how long it might take for them to begin to engage in the use of the internet in an instructional format. Now based on that effort, which I'm gonna share the results in a moment, we were fortunate enough to then to get a grant from uh, GMAT, that's the uh, Graduate Management uh, Council who administers the GMAT testing for business schools, which we've been able to conduct and carry the effort a little further, and I have some preliminary results on that effort as well. And the difference between what Jerry funded and GMAT, Jerry's focus was on, and rightly so, the university, and the GMAT enterprise was global. So we surveyed the entire world uh, to glean some insights into how people were viewing this new learning environment on a worldwide basis. The idea is this, having an access port to faculty, locally, globally, 
sharing and exchanging of ideas, again, not having to reinvent the wheel, is the whole notion behind these collaborative networks. So some core characteristics here, once again, the same old story. Whether it's a course design or a collaborative network, it's got to be easy to use. It's all click and go. Otherwise, you're going to lose interest. Secondly, the ability to share information. And thirdly, the ability to support your colleagues on a global basis. And so from the study sponsored by Jerry, we concentrated exclusively on faculty here at the Pepperdine University. In our GMAT research project, we expanded that to get administrators in the loop and researchers and accrediting bodies as well. Because ultimately, in the design of any new program, you would like to have all of the shareholders in <coughs> That's the idea, including students, because they're the consumer of this set of products. That was the spirit behind what we were about. We put together last fall a prototype system, thanks to Ms. Wallace, among other things, uh, for testing out the idea here at the Grand Idea School. And it came in handy because we had WASP accreditors on campus in the fall, and we showed them what we were doing. And so they sort of got the idea and we use this system as well in working through some of the, our new online uh, aspects of our MBA program. So this one that uh, we, we fashioned, if you will, uh, we have a, an ability to share documents through Box. We have a synchronous join me capability for meeting activities. We have a video cam opportunity. And then, we, of course, we have Yammer for that asynchronous component uh, in terms of interacting. So we have this up and running as we speak. And if you're interested, I'll send me an email and I'll send you a link and go up and join us. And uh, we're hoping to flesh this out uh, over the next year or so and begin to get Grazi Dia faculty and eventually university faculty engaged in, in, in this process. So it turned out uh, Ms. Wallace probably will have other comments, but not a huge effort. There was an effort, but not a huge effort to, uh, to get this thing put together. She's the good-looking one in the back, so yeah, don't look at me. Now, to, uh, to the survey. So we uh, surveyed all five of Pepperdine schools. And we, uh, we had a response rate for this first question of uh, slightly under 100. So they're fairly good. We, we couldn't dissect it too much, but you'll get some ideas. So online learning tools can create efficiencies in teaching. 81% of the responding faculty said yes, they either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. And that's a fairly powerful uh, concept. Again, this survey was done last summer. So it's reasonably current. And it, I believe, makes a remarkable statement that there's the least uh, awareness sense that indeed the uh, internet can provide uh, significant uh, enhancement to the learning process. Was there a difference between these five schools? Ah, glad you asked. Uh, some. Uh, one, the public policy school was, the sample size was like four or five, so it's very hard to differentiate there. The law school relies on some other resources outside our Sakai learning management system. But if you send me an email, I'll send you the report. And there were some differences, no doubt about it, uh, in that regard. Good question. Uh, here, same sample size. And uh, the, the gist here was uh, our peer and aspirational institutions uh, are increasingly the use of online. And in this case, 64% either agree or strongly agree with that statement. So not only do we have an awareness inside, but we also have an awareness that our competitors, and we are getting more competitors by the minute uh, in a graduate management education. We had a faculty retreat last Friday down at the, am I still dropping names, New Porter uh, down there? And we had a guest speaker from Seattle University. And he showed two slides. One slide of where uh, their competition was five years ago, and there were like three players. 
a new slide that the entire slide was filled up with maybe 10 or 12 uh, new competitors in their arena. Either they have physically shown up or they're available on the internet. So for an example, Michigan is now a competitor in Seattle for Seattle business. And uh, this is going to increase, not decrease, and we certainly have that uh, uh, exposure here as well. So good news in the sense that there is an awareness in general terms, anytime you get a number above 50%, you've got to be happy, that uh, good news that the, uh, we have a sense that something's happening here and we sort of need to pay attention. Here, again, above 50%, hybrid or blended learning, that's that mixture model I reported on, will be important to the future at Pepperdine University. So how you define hybrid or blending is, is kind of an open question. But the ability to use the internet to supplement the classroom experience. And again, we're above 50%, which is good. And then finally, uh, the, uh, the utility of a collaborative network 63% either agreed or strongly agreed that a network would be very helpful in enhancing uh, the educational process, both in terms of program design and delivery. So these are encouraging results, sir. Who are the, who are the other? <coughs> ah, okay. We, uh, the other was contract fact. Okay, so non-tenure track. Yeah, non-tenure non -tenure track. track and non -tenure. You okay. said it better than I did. Yeah, non-tenure track, contract folks, uh, and the like. Uh, and you and can see some some variation there. Yes, sir. And what percentage of the overall respondents were um, in the other category? Of the total here? Yeah, of the 98. Uh, I would say probably under a third. Ballpark okay. number. We at the Grazi School have approximately, I'm going to call them contract, you may have another name for them, about 18 out of our uh, ballpark number, our contract type folks, and the other schools have different names for them, but it's in that range. So 20, 25 percent. Adjuncts. Adjuncts, yeah, that would work. Although at the Brazilian School, due to our slightly student decline, we don't have too many of those anymore. Why? Because the enrollments are down. <laughs> Has the faculty been decreased equally in adjuncts and full-time professors? Glad you asked. Now, Gary has initiated the uh, old age retirement package, and he continues to nominate me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we've had a, uh, I'm going to put in quotes, a uh, golden parachute program for the last couple of years, and I think seven or eight very senior faculty retired uh, this last year. So yes, to answer your question, there has been a, a powering down a bit in that area too. Are they equal, percentage-wise? Uh, yeah, I would say close, close enough. All right, now, in addition to those survey results, we also had folks rank order <coughs> the support services Jerry's providing, and so these were the top three. We listed about 10. So the number one uh, listed item was uh, Sakai. And recall, when we did the survey, it had only been about a year or a little bit more when we had transformed from Blackboard to Sakai. So it wasn't like we had five years of experience. Still at all, not rank number one. Number two, the ability to share documents. And then number three, the web conferencing like Illuminate, if you will. Uh, uh, those were the top three ranked items that the professoriate on the university level had responded to. <coughs> now, I mentioned we, we received during uh, uh, last summer a contract from GMAC to extend this a bit uh, on an international basis. And uh, again, the idea is, hey, not just limiting it to Pepperdine, but in fact, interacting on a, uh, on a university-wide uh, global basis. So we conducted a little study which we're just wrapping up. And the goal of that study was to put together an RFP so that GMAC could go out and solicit bids from a SAP, an IBM, 
uh, to actually enact this network. And so that's what the GMAC management is currently considering, among other things, the pricing model. How are, we, are they going to charge for this? But that enterprise is, as we speak, uh, closing down in terms of our efforts, and hopefully they're going to pick up the ball and run with it. And the results, and I have a little sneak peek here, uh, this was one of the questions, the importance of the internet learning to uh, fulfilling the institute's missions, and you can see here, here we cut it, by the way, by administrator, faculty, and researcher, and you can see there that, uh, if you just add these two stacks, we're in, into the uh, 90s. Everybody has gotten the message. Again, this is worldwide, so these are people from South America, South Africa. Middle East, from China, Japan, and the sense is about the same. So again, we're gone global with this. It's viral in that sense. And so uh, the notion is that uh, we at Pepperdine, I think we're pretty well in tune with the process. Now, in terms of lessons learned here, and you may want to read the gold <coughs> presentation at the bottom as I'm highlighting this. Um, our faculty at Pepperdine and from our GMAT uh, survey uh, are generally aware of the growing role of the internet, just like it was over the last 20 years in business and commerce. We're catching up. And the good news is, of course, a lot of that infrastructure is already available. Uh, collaboration provides a vehicle for the faculty to engage in a much more holistic and let me say powerful way compared to faculty meetings, which are at best are boring. You're not getting boring, are you? No, no, I'm putting it through, right? All right. Now, from our surveys, technology must be easy to use. It's got to be all click and go. It's got to go 24-7. The last thing you want is a kid coming up and says, hey, uh, Mr., this doesn't work. That's a non-starter from day one. So we've got to ensure that. We mentioned the idea of incentives, uh, and you've got to think of some more creative ways to get everybody in game. And again, for those that are reluctant to take the step, we have to minimize the risk. That's the key to this whole success story, getting everybody engaged by minimizing the risk, including Mr. Custer's risk there. Yeah. Now, to bring it home, as I mentioned at the beginning, at least from our view, employers are looking for web savvy folks. What better way to get them web savvy is to teach them over the internet. I can't imagine a better model than that. Secondly, we are facing these challenges um, and they're changing the face of graduate management education. Ms. Wallace always objects to my little picture there of the bride, uh, but it's designed to indicate renewal something new. Uh, and so the idea is that these technologies are moving quickly and just imagine where we're going to be five years from now. It's hard to draw a line to that. Also, the idea of providing the youngster knowledge at a time and convenience, especially working adults, and that sounds like a winner to me. Uh, collaboration is key to all this and Equally important, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have to form strategic alliances on a global basis. That's the key to this entire success story, and we can do it with collaboration. Now, just before we take a few questions and uh, have some fine Jerry Flynn lunch, I have a very brief video to wrap it up. Sir? Sure. And in this video, you'll see me struggling with a new learning technology a couple of years ago. And once again, you're going to see Jerry Flynn come in and, and help me out, as he has done more recently. This is just a couple of years ago I was working on this. There you go. Let's rock. That's me. That's me there. Yeah, there I am. Yeah. Here's, here's okay. Jerry. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ja, så den jakt du gjorde ting hele formiddagen, ja? Ja, jeg beklager at jeg tar ting, og så skjønner vi at vi holder på å legge om til et helt fyrst, så ser vi at da skal alle ha gjort på en gang, vet du? Ja, så du kommer ikke unnlig den, eller? Nei, den bare ligger der. Ok, har du forsøkt å åpne den? 
Vi åpnet den, altså hvis det hadde vært så enkelt, så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt helt det, skal det vel? Nei, det er sant. Vil du huske på en kant? Nei, det skal være fort og klart, jeg må se. Så vi bare gjør... Sånn, da er vi i gang. Ja, altså så langt kom jeg også. Ok. Men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med laget tekst. Så når du kommer videre, så tar du tak i et ark, på den måten her, og så blar du over på neste side sånn. Da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar altså. Du blar, ja. Men når jeg skal tilbake da? Nei, da bare blar du tilbake igjen. Ta tak der, og så er det sånn. Der, så er du tilbake til den teksten du hadde sagt. Ok, så slutter der, og så... Så fortsetter den der, ja. Ok, men når jeg skal avslutte for dagen, hva gjør jeg da? Ja, bare slår du sammen permene. Ja. På den måten der. Sånn. Der lukker til, ligger alt lagret inni der. Altså, jeg risikerer ikke å miste noe av teksten her. Nei, alt ligger lagret inni her, ja. Det er tilfellet å sette fyr på, eller ja, det er kanskje litt sannsynlig. Ja, ok. Nei, men for det er noe med at når du har holdt på med skriftruller, så tar det litt tid å konvertere til å bla i en bøk. Ja. Ja, ok. Det var gjort. Ja, men du, jeg tenker før det går. Jeg må bare gå igjen en gang til. Altså, jeg åpner sånn, og så, hva du kalte det? Blar. Jeg blar. Ja, blar vil du. Blar frem og tilbake. Og når jeg er ferdig, så bare lukker jeg den. Flott! Fint det! Kjempefint! Nei, men du! Vær litt! Ikke sant? Nå er den sånn igjen nå, for jeg kåpet den. Jeg kåpet den. Men at du har den fra feil siden. Du har den åpnet fra andre siden. Så det er ikke like gyldig det, altså. Åpnet fra den siden der. Sånn. Der. Der er den åpnet. Ja, vel! Har du ikke spørsmålet av den, eller? Manualen? Jeg skal følge med som manualen, så bruker vi en ledning. Den sikkert denne. Der vet du. Åja, den ja! Ja, ja, men ikke at det er det samme problemet. Får du ikke? Ok, det skal vi kanskje tenke på. Alright, thank you very much, everyone. So I think we're about ready for lunch. Take a couple of questions if you like. Email me if you'd like any of those two reports. We'll be happy to send them to you. Thank you. Please join me, uh, Thank you, Professor Hall. Thank you. Do you have a check? The, the, um, folks, we actually have one more session before lunch. Lunch starting at 1 o'clock.